Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? So we're nearly done. Hope it was a great morning. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I have about 20 minutes to talk to you about Open Innovation 2.0. And I want to make one, one small point about being open to innovation. Uh, so I have a, a lot of slides, so we'll do a drive-by shooting. And afterwards, I'll be around. If anybody wants to talk to me, um, I'll, I'll certainly be around. So um, I want to use a quote from our CEO. It's always, always uh, safe to use a quote from your CEO, but uh, our CEO made, a, I think, a very important statement in Washington a couple of years ago. He said that, Paul Ottolini, the future for every nation or the future for every city will be shaped by new ideas and creativity. These are the engines of future prosperity. I don't think anybody would argue uh, with that. Uh, we're going to talk about open innovation, but before we talk about what is open innovation, I know Brian gave you a definition. I'm sure John, talked about it, and John Shaw is actually a fantastic example actually of a practitioner, has a full-time job, but is heavily involved and actually with different networks, and a brilliant example of Open Innovation 2.0. Our definition of innovation is quite simple. It's ideas by execution, by adoption. Um, there's a gentleman in MIT has a great um, saying. He says, innovation is not innovators innovating, it's customers adopting. So if something is called innovation, the first thing you have to do is look at is there a customer who's adopting it. Um, maybe just to mention, I think what's happening here in Dublin is a really good example actually of innovation. There are lots of ideas, there's execution, and, and there is adoption going on. And great credit to Peter and, and, and the team and Dirge and Mary. Um, just what we have here is a platform for emergence, and if you look how far um, innovation in Dublin has happened, I can't think of another city in Europe, in fact, worldwide, where there's such an awareness of the possibilities for innovation and a culture that's emerging to, to support innovation. So you know, the Innovation Dublin event, October 15 to 26, it actually is quite a unique event. You know, we're working in many cities worldwide. We, we haven't come across a comparable initiative. Um, Intel as a company is very, th you're thinking forward looking, but many other companies are thinking the same. And there is this propensity from large companies to participate in open innovation activities. And our vision statement is a couple of years old. We talk about this decade, we'll uh, create and extend computing technology, which you might expect. But it's all about connecting and enriching the lives of everybody on the planet. Um, Michael Porter, who did, wrote a lot around core competencies and you know, Porter's Five Forces model, uh, he's talked more and more about shared value organizations. And shared value organizations are organizations that are not just about profit, but they're about actually solving society's problems, seizing new opportunities. So more and more companies are much more open to, to actually participating in open innovation. And I like Brian's talk from Trinity, and I think we're seeing universities even change. Um, in the past, universities were responsible for education, uh, information diffusion. In the last 10, 15 years, Irish universities have got better at research, and SFI have invested in that. Uh, but the new mantra for the 21st century is value creation from universities. Now, um, I won't speak for all of the academics, but many of the academics will resist that. Uh, but I think Brian is an example of um, an re academic researcher that has embraced that. Um, there's a big responsibility for the universities to actually create value, not just commercial value, but um, a societal value. The organization that I'm responsible for leading at Intel is called Intel Labs Europe. We're about advancing Intel, but we're also about advancing the broader European project. And we've very much aligned our research outputs with Europe 2020. We've, we've had the opportunity to work closely with the European Commission on the formation of Digital Agenda and Innovation Union. You might be aware of these uh, two flagship initiatives. And our outputs are very much uh, aligned with uh, advancing those two initiatives and the broader Europe 2020, which is about sustained and um, in, in, or sustainable and inclusive growth. Um, I think we'll recognize that innovation is very much moving out of the lab. In the past, there was a brilliant scientist in a Bell lab or an IBM lab or an Intel lab that came up with the innovation. Um, open innovation, to a certain extent, is actually almost you know, what happened last decade. And we now we're into really ecosystem innovation or network innovation. If we had more time, we, we could talk about uh, the provenance of this. But you only have to look at what's happening in phones, where you have the iPhone competing with Android, competing with Microsoft and Nokia to see actually the innovation ecosystem that has the biggest critical mass and the highest innovation velocity uh, has the most uh, momentum. 
And with respect to Intel Labs Europe, we've grown very much over the last couple of years, largely through open innovation. In fact, we've doubled in, in size and we're in 11, 11 or 12 different countries. But today we're 40, 40 labs. Um, some of them are working on blue sky work. Others are actually working on direct development and, and shipping uh, products to, to other companies. We've more than 4,000 R&D professionals. But probably the strength of what we, we work at is that we have a research ecosystem of more than 400 different organizations. Uh, they, they could be large multinationals like an Ericsson's or Philips or SAP, could be a leading university. But it's also quite a few um, high performance startups and then there are influential policy makers. So it's very much, the game has very much moved to actually the, the ecosystem. Um, I have the privilege at the moment of leading, chairing an EU group called Open Innovation Strategy Policy Group and what this group uh, it's formed or created by um, DG Information Society, but it's mostly made up of leading industrial companies and some academics. And what we're trying to do is um, drive the recognition of open innovation as a new paradigm in Europe and um, to help change thinking, policies, even some of the instruments in Horizon 2020 are being adapted to uh, really embrace open innovation more and more and arguably FP7 and Horizon 2020 is the largest open innovation fund in the world. Uh, we just published our, our new outlook for 2012 just this week. It's available at open-innovation.eu and actually there's two or three years of these um, yeah, yearbooks available and lots of best practices examples from, from across Europe if you're interested. At Intel we're seeing three mega trends. We're seeing digital transformations which is driven by Intel and many companies in our ecosystem. We see sustainability as a new paradigm, financial sustainability, but more and more environmental sustainability and the idea that we can meet all of our demand, the growth demands of our current society while not compromising uh, the prospects of, of future uh, societies and um, so on. And then finally, mass collaboration, and I'll, I'll come to that. But at the core of this is open innovation. We see these three things that are uh, really fueling the open innovation fire. And doubling is a fantastic example um, of this, and, and one of the applications that's available there in the App Store that I really like is Fixture Street. This is enabled, coming back to Tree Trends, it's um, enabled by the digital transformation. Uh, it's about sustainability and you're know, making the, the, the city's roads and, and, and so on uh, better. And it's in, uh, fueled by mass collaboration. I think it's a, a simple example of how these uh, trends uh, come together. Uh, Moore's Law is driving a lot of what we, 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 we see going on. And very simply, Moore's Law is about doubling transistor density every 18 months and delivering that at less or equal cost. Now the business consequence and societal consequence of that is that information, the cost of information is falling year on year and there are more and more opportunities to substitute information for other resources um, in society. And we see Moore's Law colliding with virtually every domain. In fact, I, I can't think of a single domain that isn't being disrupted or changed uh, for, to, for the positive uh, by, by, by Moore's Law. Not just to talk about mass collaboration, the European Internet Foundation collection of forward-looking MEPs produced a very nice report, A Digital World in 2025. Um, they saw lots of trends, but the one thing that they called out the central paradigm we propose is that of a world driven by mass collaboration. I think that's really true. As we look forward, we're going to have lots of lots more person-to-person -person collaboration. We're going to see lots more person-to-machine collaboration and way more machine-to-machine -machine collaboration. You, if you look forward, even in three to four years, Intel, we're predicting about 15 billion connected devices on the internet. Basically, if something has computing power, it actually will connect and it will, it will communicate. And we're really into the era. We've gone through from the PC into the internet and into the era of social computing, where our computing, where we're leveraging collective intelligence. So Henry Chesbro obviously coined and uh, the phrase um, open innovation did a really nice job um, sort of describing that. Obviously didn't invent it, it had been going on for quite a while, but we can think about this really as open innovation 1.0 and essentially not all of the smart people in the world will work for your organization or your university and the idea that innovations or ideas can move um, in, in and out of um, organizations. Um, but complemented with that is the idea of triple helix innovation. Henry Ektovitz has been writing about this for, for more than a decade. And the idea that um, the, there's an opportunity and indeed a responsibility for universities 
industry and government to work together to drive structural changes beyond the scope of what any one organization could do um, on their own. So this leads us to Open Innovation 2.0, uh, which is where we get ecosystem-wide uh, innovation. I know Brian mentioned users, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but we, we have you know, increasing infrastructure, we're seeing lots of spillover effects uh, from innovations in companies and universities that go into the, into the broader society. And the pace of innovation um, accelerates dramatically. And Ray Kurzweil has talked a lot about this in the last decade. Some of you might be familiar with his work on the singularity or the law of accelerating returns. And he's predicting, and probably rightfully so, that we'll see more innovation in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last couple of hundred. And just as we look around, I'm certainly surprised at the ever-increasing pace of, of innovation and the ever-increasing level of interconnectivity uh, between us all. Um, in, in industrial organizations, and to give an example from Intel Labs Europe and, in, and Intel Labs, we are more and more practicing this idea of quadruple helix innovation where it's not just working with, in, with other uh, industry players, not just working with academics, not just working with the government or cities as we do with, with Peter Finnegan and his team here, but more and more working with, with the end users. And with users both at the creation um, standpoint, where they're involved in the creation process, uh, but also actually in, in the composition of services in, in real time. I'll give you an example of that uh, with, with Dublin City very shortly. Uh, the user, of course, is becoming much more um, important. And there's a very nice report uh, in the, the Open Innovation 2.0 Outlook that I mentioned. Uh, we, as an OISPG, we, we completed a project last year about the socio-economic uh, impacts of, of open innovation that was led by um, uh, Logic and the Innovation and, and Value Institute and Intel and Nokia and IBM participated in that. But um, in that report, it talks about actually the inverting of the open innovation uh, pyramid where innovation is really shifting from the technologists and the service providers uh, to the user. And um, Jean-Claude Bergelman, who's, who's with the EU, uh, he was already writing about this, um, you know, five, six, uh, seven, eight years ago. Um, the shift from consumers, the user as a consumer, to a contributor. And now, actually, we're talking about uh, the user as a prosumer or, or really as, as um, an innovator. Uh, we have a collab with Nokia in uh, northern Finland. Uh, it's with the city of Aulu. Uh, but is also involving uh, many of the citizens of, of Aulu. There's 200,000 um, citizens there, and they've you know, all bought in, not obviously, not obviously every individual one. Uh, but the reason we put this lab into northern Finland, it wasn't an obvious choice, was the ability to work very closely with the city and uh, with um, city dwellers around uh, future services that might be available on mobile phones, particularly around uh, 3D services. Uh, just to give you a couple examples of Open Innovation 2.0 in practice, um, Deirdre mentioned the Innovation Value Institute. Actually, you know, John and, and mainstream renewable technologies are very strong contributors uh, to that. That was established more than six years ago. The half-life of a consortium like this is typically about six months. There's lots of interest, and then it, die, it dies off because there's lots of hard, hard work that needs to happen. But today, there are more than 80 organizations, uh, governments, industry, academics working together to um, create a new standard for how companies and governments can create uh, value from, from technology. I'm really pleased that more than 300 um, companies and governments worldwide have actually adopted the output of the research uh, organization. And it's an example of an institute that connects research with education and, and indeed practice. So more than 500 executives have taken professional diplomas of various classes um, that are coming out of the Innovation Value Institute. And we just had our uh, summer summit last week and we had some tremendous speakers, you know, CIO from BP, from Logica, several great speakers from, from the European Commission. Uh, but to bring open innovation actually very close to home here, I would have to say we have an outstanding partnership with Dublin City and with Trinity College and indeed with NUI Maynooth um, around thinking about smart and, and sustainable um, cities. And this is a, a partnership collaboration that is gathering momentum, it's gathering steam. It's like uh, many innovations, it starts through relatively simple interactions and all of a sudden uh, complex systems, new options, innovation options start uh, to emerge. And 
One of the exciting things that's happening is a, a solution called CityWatch, which is thinking about the real-time needs of cities, leveraging real-time information and real opportunities to work together uh, better. Um, this is in part support, um, uh, supported by SFI and it's Dublin City working with Intel and the Distributed Systems Group at, at, at Trinity College. Uh, as we think about future cities uh, research, we're thinking about uh, sensing, we're thinking about communications, and then applying intelligence, and this delivers us improved services. Now, these and services could be as simple as just some autonomic resource optimization. So we're making real-time resource optimization decisions, or it could be totally new services to citizens or businesses, and some really, really exciting um, opportunities um, you know, happening there. If we go back to the um, mass collaboration idea, uh, we're thinking about large scale, scale or urban sensing, and I, I mentioned the idea that in, in the future we may have as much as 15 billion connected devices on the Internet of Things within, you know, by 2015 or 2016. Uh, in fix, fixed sensing, we'll have sensors at a fixed place in the environment. They could be weather sensors, they could be CCTV, for example. Um, in San Francisco, a number of years ago, Intel, our lab in Berkeley, instrumented the, the, um, the rubbish collection uh, trucks with, with pollution sensors, and all of a sudden we started, or the city of San Francisco started to get a, a picture of you know, where were the hot spots for, for pollution um, in, in the city. And more and more, uh, we're going to um, see participatory sensing where individuals will actually start to report data, stuff that they see, they may take pictures, or there actually may be sensors uh, on their particular devices. Uh, one of the most exciting initiatives that Intel is driving is the launch of uh, a product called Ultrabook. You might have uh, seen the Ultrabooks. They're you know, very thin and light. They're about an, uh, 0.8 of an inch uh, thick. Uh, but later this year, we'll be shipping several, or a number of the Ultrabooks actually with embedded uh, sensors that will report in real time lots of different um, uh, conditions. We're currently trialing out of our energy and sustainability lab an application called POEM, Personal Office Energy Manager, where we've equipped ultrabooks and notebooks with various sensors in an office environment, and we're able to create a new uh, ad hoc pseudo um, SCADA system supervisory control and data acquisition where office workers can actually uh, feed the information about the ambient conditions in the building, be it temperature or humidity, and that uh, drives a more comfortable environment for them, but also allows uh, better energy optimization um, in, in, in the building. Um, and what we'll try and do in the City Watch application is combine data from different sources to extract high-level information. And um, I'm, I'm quite pushed for time here, but here's just a, a one particular scenario. Um, you know, and I think this is uh, very real. <laughs> Uh, Joe is an accountant, he's walking to the bus stop after work, and heavy rain has um, added to the usual uh, con congestion. So he's approaching the bus stop, and City Watch application informs Joe of, of, of an issue. Stop number 55 is closed due to substantial flooding on Baker Street. Um, City Watch proposes, well, there's another route you can take, etc., etc. Uh, we'll step through this, and Joe might actually provide some feedback uh, on this, and more and more we see uh, user rating of services, you know, like on TripAdvisor, is, is hugely um, influential. And then Anne is somebody who's working in the city, and she's actually uh, responding and seeing what's happening um, in, in, in real time. Uh, she's getting data from a number of different um, city dwellers, and she, she can quickly aggregate both, both automated data and the data that's coming in real time to actually drive some decisions that uh, drive uh, better interventions than, than could happen uh, today. And um, she's you know responding and so on. Let me just um, stop there. Uh, I wanted to sort of finish by giving... Um, Another example of open innovation, which is a collaboration between Intel and the UK government and Imperial College London and uh, University College London, and this is an institute for sustainable and, and connected cities that will work very closely with D Dublin City and, and Trinity College. And what we're trying to do here is to um, jointly create, using open innovation, novel, here's a list of types of re research outputs. and. Uh, of course, you know, the academics will publish papers, um, but again, that paradigm that academics are measured on, um, people will think I'm on a rant here, just on uh, publications is so 19th or 20th, 20th century 
Um, we need to have a much broader spectrum of outputs from our research institute. So what we're thinking about in London is novel user experiences, understanding what are the future workloads of the city. So one of the big challenges for London, anybody that's flown into London in the last few weeks or months will see actually the city is already seriously stressed and what's going to happen uh, actually when, uh, you know, maybe more than 100,000 people or, or more converge on London for the, for the Olympics and wouldn't it be nice if we could simulate this uh, in advance and figure out what are the in interventions we, we, we need to make and change the business logic. Of course we need to talk about the future network architectures and, uh, and protocols, security and privacy are, are really important. What are the new opportunities in big data? Some advances like in-memory databases are changing the way we can actually optimize in real time. So for example, we have a collaboration with SAP uh, where in the past uh, an optimization, a batch job that would take about 17 hours can now complete in three minutes. So banks, for example, are using these applications, these kind of applications to decide, well, what should their, ca their cash positions be? You know, overnight they can now run these sophisticated analysis in three minutes. But as we continue to improve the technology, we can get these kind of optimizations to complete in a matter of seconds. And if you have dependable cloud computing, you can start to optimize in, in real time in the city. So you're about to take a journey. Uh, you can actually uh, schedule or put that journey actually into an optimization um, system. And it will actually in real time give you um, the best uh, uh, route. And actually will optimize, can, you know, in real time optimize uh, traffic throughout the city. Um, you talked, there was a discussion today earlier on around sort of business models and um, uh, Alexander Osterwalder's work around business model innovation, business model canvases, of course, uh, brown, groundbreaking. We've had the opportunity in the last number of years uh, to work with a company called Dublin. Uh, Larry Keeley is the founder and they have some, some groundbreaking work showing actually that business model innovation is probably the area of greatest return for innovation. and. Another piece of related research, um, Dublin showed that most of the innovation efforts over the last decade or so have gone into improving product performance faster, cheaper, better. That's what Intel does. We try and make our processors faster, cheaper, better. That's what BMW does with their engines and so on. Uh, but this is the area of actually lowest return based on the Dublin research. Um, so that doesn't mean that you stop investing in product innovation because if you don't have a product, you're not in business. But the big returns are coming from business model innovation. Apple is a really good example of that. Amazon is a really good example um, of that. So business model innovation is going to be particularly important for cities in terms of the adoption of, of um, new technology. So we've just launched the um, um, new institute in, in London. Um, and just to mention, we, we were, did this launch two weeks ago at Downing Street. Uh, the Chancellor George Osborne, over a series of meetings, actually was directly brokering the relationship between Intel and in, in the past, I think this is noteworthy, University College London, Imperial College London, two of the top 10 universities in the world in the past, you know, hugely competitive, not very collaborative, but I have to say, you know, the chemistry between the two, it was like working with a single organization. I think this is more and more the future. And in, in Ireland, we, we have to have our seven universities working together really as one university rather than as, as competitors because we're, we're too small. Uh, so we're very excited about what's happening in London. We're very excited what's happening in Dublin. And we're working very closely with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, ICT Labs, which is one of the kicks. And we, we had Professor Willem Jonker here a week ago. He's made several visits uh, in the last month or so. And we hope later in the year to be able to announce a uh, new ICT Labs hub in London with Dublin uh, as a satellite specifically to work on digital cities and future cities. Uh, one or two last examples. Um, more than 20 years ago, I had the opportunity, I was working with Philips Labs in, in Eindhoven, and the NAT Lab was one of the most famous labs in the world. It was very much a, a closed uh, innovation environment, you know, high security, you know, huge sort of patent output. Uh, but Philips made the decision to open this up as, a, um, as a, an open innovation campus. And they've, they've moved the whole area, you know, if, if, they, if you think about the, 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 the Dutch, national uh, innovation strategy, they talk about their airport, they talk about the seaport in, in Rotterdam, and they talk about Eindhoven as the brain port, and now there are more than 8,000 um, international uh, people and um, you know, more than 100 companies um, in this campus, and of course Philips is, is still thriving in the campus. 
British Telecom are doing something very similar. Astral Park in the UK is a, is a few years behind this, but again, BT opened up this very close park in, in Martlesham, and um, it's now well on its way to be you know, emulating what's happened in, in Eindhoven. A few last ideas. Value innovation originated in, um, in India, and something that's you know, hugely um, topical and popular, and, it, it's, uh, and rightfully so. The idea that as we innovate, we drive down the costs and we actually increase the value. And I think uh, collectively as a society, and, and this is our business environment, people got lazy. And I think the new pressures that we see actually are dramatically um, increasing the importance and the relevance of value innovation. The last point I'd like to make is, okay, innovating is not enough. Um, we've identified um, through our, um, our work at least six vectors that are important to uh, the adoption of innovations to create benefits. So there has to be a vision, and you know very clearly there is a vision in Dublin. You know John Tierney and, and Peter Finnegan have a vision of you know Dublin really as a, as a hotbed uh, for innovation. Has to be prototypes and technologies, of course. There has to be business cases, but then we get into the soft stuff: business process change, organizational change, and indeed you know customer and societal change. So is are the customers? Is society? willing and able uh, to adopt uh, the solutions that are, are being provided. And you know, very often as technology, technologists, we can forget about that. But uh, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to, to adoption. Uh, so it's been a, a great pleasure to um, talk with you today, just to congratulate Peter and Deirdre and Mary and everybody involved uh, with the innovation efforts in, in Dublin and, and Dublin. Uh, Dublin is certainly in a very healthy position with respect to encouraging innovation and, and creating a climate of, of innovation that, that really will, I think, you know, foster uh, and uh, allow, allow innovation to grow. So thanks for your attention. This is the final piece, but uh, I would like to throw it open to the floor, see if anybody has questions for uh, Professor Curley. We're just running 10 minutes late, so just, uh, so uh, is there anybody who would Sorry. <coughs> I, I, I'm just uh, wondering what sort of a, uh, agreements in town would have in place for open innovation, what sort of uh, privacy agreements, all that sort of crap. Yeah, we have to put a lot of work into it. It's not, it's, you know, you don't do everything. We have, you know, in our network across Europe, many of the labs are involved in open innovation activity, but some of them are, have actually, it's, it's, it's closed. And, you know, when we're working on our future products, for example, but a really good source, this, this area is actually, it's very topical. The Open Innovation Strategy Policy Group, there's a report we published about two years ago, which talks about, um, the legal implications and IP implications of um, open innovation. That, that report was published by Jacqueline Valla, and I think that's a really good source of your interest in, in, in that area. It's available from openinnovation.eu, and uh, you know, we, work, we work very hard, and we continuously iterate and refine our um, open innovation uh, agreements and IP agreements to, to make sure that we're protected, that our co-innovators are protected, and most of all, that we actually are able to create, create value together. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards if you'd like more information.